That is why we're here to lift praise to him, because he's faithful. So let's sing of why he's faithful today.
statement of faith saying, our life is yours, Jesus. We trust you with it. in the name of Jesus I'm choosing today I never want to be the same This life I'm leading It's all yours It's all yours It's all yours It's all yours Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been the fourth man in the fire, time after time. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood.
trust in God. Hey guys, good morning. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to worship together this morning. We praise you for who you are and what you've done. We pray that your Holy Spirit would meet us here today and that we would be changed by the word of God and the teaching that Andy brings to us. We pray this all in your son's name. Amen. All right, guys, stay standing for a quick second. I've got a couple quick announcements for you. I want to welcome you to All Church. My name's Katie and I'm your host. And we're so glad that you're here, whether you're joining us online or here in person. We've got a way that we like to connect with you through the connect cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. So if you haven't gotten a chance to fill one of those out yet, we'd invite you to do so today. You can put information on it and hand it in up at Guest Central in the front corner of the lobby. We will trade it for a free t-shirt. So we'd love to meet you, hear any part of your story that you're willing to share and just say hello. A couple quick things. Starting point is gonna be next week here at All Church from six to 7.30. Starting Point is a place for anyone who's considering making All Church your church home and becoming a member here. You'll be able to ask your questions, learn how we operate, how we do things here, hear from the elders and the leadership team and the pastors, and be in a room full of other people asking the same questions. So if that's something you've been considering, we hope that you'll join us next week. Child care will be provided at that event. And lastly, our, our church is heading to Mazatlan again this summer. We've gotten to go year after year in partnership with Back to Back Ministries. We love that we get to partner with them in many ways through support financially, through supporting their staff, other volunteers, other trips, and then every once in a while we get to actually go. So this is one of those really exciting times. And if that's something that sparks interest for you, we hope that you'll consider going. There's information, the QR code is just holds information. So if you're, you're not sure, you just have a lot of questions, that's just an interest form. We hope that you would scan it and fill it out, hopefully get some information and consider going. That's gonna be in July from the 13th to the 18th. Thank you guys for your generosity. There's so many cool things that God is doing through All Church and through you. We hope you'll keep giving in the different ways that you do. There's ways on the screen behind me if you'd like to step into that call in generosity. 30 seconds, chit chat with the people around you, then Andy will be up. Well, hey guys, how are we doing today? All right. I'm so glad you're here. Thanks for coming. Are you ready? ready. Come on. Are, are you ready? All right. <laughs> well, I got to ask you that because we got a lot to get through today. I know that's not a great hook because all of a sudden your lunch plans just went out the window. I'm just joking. We're going to get right to it. So go ahead and turn with me to Genesis chapter 40. This is an incredible part of Joseph's life. Uh, if you've been with us here at All Church the last few weeks, we've been spending some time to work through basically kind of the second half of the book of Genesis, which is the first half or the first book of the Bible. We've been looking at this man by the name of Joseph. He's probably the best Old Testament representative or Old Testament figure of, of, the new, of, of Christ coming in the New Testament. We see the most parallels between Jesus and Joseph than really anybody in the Old Testament. Uh, we picked it up week one. Joseph was or is the the son of, his dad's name was jo Jacob and his mom's name was Rachel. Rachel was beautiful and Joseph was preferred, if you will, by his dad. He, he kind of had a privileged position in the household, but he had a lot of other brothers and he had one sister and we, we all know, we don't have to go very far in agreement to realize that whenever you privilege or you hold one child in a higher regard than the others, it's, it's trouble. So that's what happened in this dysfunctional family, so much so that the brothers wanted to kill Joseph. One brother kind of spoke up and said, we shouldn't kill him, <laughs> which, yeah, okay, thank you, you know, applaud, somebody finally picked up on it, you shouldn't kill your brother, but instead let's throw him into a pit, which I guess is okay. So they threw him into a pit. His plan was he was going to come back and rescue Joseph later. In the meantime, before he got back, his brothers sold Joseph to some traveling uh, salespeople, okay, just people who are 
buying and selling in slavery, and so they bought Joseph off his brothers. His brother came back to rescue him. Guess who's not in the pit? Joseph. His brother weeps for his brother, so Reuben weeps for Joseph. And then all the brothers go back to dad, Jacob, and lie to dad and say, a wild animal got your son. We, you know, there's nothing we could do. Meanwhile, Joseph is purchased by a guy named Potiphar in England. His wife's name was, well, his wife's name was Potiphar's wife. She really didn't have a name. And um, what ended up happening was the Lord was with Joseph such that God elevated Joseph inside Potiphar's household to second only to Potiphar himself. Well, while that's taking place, Potiphar's wife, we talked about this last week, Potiphar's wife, the scripture tells us, has had eyes that were longing for Joseph. And so day after day after day, she wants to be with Joseph. Last week, we talked about sexual temptation and how it's the one area of life that, man, all of us can identify with. And I love that it's in the scriptures in Joseph, that Potiphar's wife was longing to be with Joseph. Finally, one day... She had cleared out all the men from the house. Joseph comes into the house. She physically reaches out to try to grab him and basically says, come to bed with me. He panics, runs away, leaves his coat. She takes his coat, goes to her husband and says, that man that you brought into our house, he tried to rape me today. And at the end of chapter 39, under those false accusations, Joseph is in prison. That's where we're going to pick it up today. May I ask you a question? You don't have to put your hands up, but I wonder how many of us are familiar with disappointment. I think all of us would be. I think it's a common kind of human emotion. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. We're all familiar with disappointment. Here's why I bring it up. If you're a Christ follower, if you're following Jesus, you believe that God is a sovereign God over our lives and that he has a hand of providence throughout our lives. So, and here's what I want you to follow me on as we kind of begin in Genesis 40. If I'm saying right now that I'm disappointed in you, or you might be disappointed in me, or we are disappointed in what someone has done to us, I think you'd agree it's not a far leap to go from being disappointed in people to being disappointed in God because of what that person has done to us. Because again, if we believe in sovereignty and we believe in providence, that God has a plan for our lives, which he does. You see, it's not far, it's not hard to go from disappointing, being disappointed in people and being disappointed in God. Because God, why didn't you stop that? And I'm not just talking about someone's late to a meeting. I'm talking about some of you are, are like you're carrying a lot of heaviness. Because even though a person may have done something or didn't do something they were supposed to to you, people will always let us down, right? But man, as a Christ follower and as a, I pray, Jesus-centered people, it's pretty quick to go right to, wait, God, why didn't you stop that? Or why did you allow that? And these big questions come to mind. I, I want you to think about those as we get into Genesis 40. Because here's what we said. And this is kind of a theme throughout the book or the story of Joseph. We need to rally around this conviction and this truth that we are to obey God and then leave the consequences up to him. Okay, we've got to obey God and then leave the consequences up to him. In fact, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and what? He will direct your paths. So what is our role? We're to obey him, and what is his role? He directs our paths. As we saw last week, Joseph obeyed. And and I just want to be like raw with you for a minute. Like Joseph obeyed. So every one of us would say, well, then good things ought to happen to him. Like God, when I obey you and I do the hard thing when it's hard to do, like I want to believe that there's some kind of blessing or there's some kind of, I don't know, you know, just recognition from you for my obedience. And yet here at the end of 39, Joseph did the right thing and went to jail for it. And I don't want to like pass that by. That stinks for him. Okay. So here we are. We're going to pick it up there. 
Sometime after this, okay, so he's been in prison for a little bit. Sometime after this, the cupbearer, the king of Egypt, and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. Okay, so the king of Egypt and Pharaoh, they're the same people, just different titles. Verse 2, Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. Look at the end of verse 4. They continued for some time in custody. So we're introduced to two brand new people here, the cupbearer and a baker. Some of your versions might say the butler and the baker. I don't like that as much because this, the, the, the butler didn't stand at the door of Pharaoh's house dressed in a tuxedo and take people's coats. His job, the cupbearer's job, was he, imagine he had like a necklace with the key to the wine cellar on it. And if Pharaoh wanted a bottle of wine, it was his job to go and get the drink, go to get the bottle of wine and to pour a little bit into his cup first before giving it to Pharaoh and to, to taste or to sample the wine. Why? Because if the wine was bad, well, it, he didn't want it to kill Pharaoh, so it would actually kill whom? It would kill him. <laughs> that, I mean, that's his job. His job was to ensure Pharaoh's health and safety by actually dying in his place if somebody tried to poison the wine. And the baker, his job wasn't as cool to explain Okay, his job was he just baked things, okay? So you have the baker and you have this cupbearer. All we know is something happened kind of in the palace or in the house, and these two men were implicated in it. We don't really know what it was. It may have been some kind of plot to assassinate the Pharaoh. And so the Pharaoh and his guard, they don't know what's happening, but they think one or both of these two men were involved in it, so we're going to put them in prison while we figure out what's happening. And who do they meet in prison? Joseph. Uh-oh. Like, I hope you see that. And you're like, ah, oh, okay, that's awesome. I wonder what's going to happen here. Because if you look up just a few verses at the end of chapter 20, uh, 39, you'll see in verse 23 that the keeper of the prison, which is the warden, the warden paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge. Why? Because the Lord was with him. That is a theme in Joseph's life. You put Joseph anywhere and God's with him. And I want you to hear me on that, that he is now in prison. He has been elevated to a position of authority, to a position of responsibility within the prison, and he's being used mightily within prison. I mean, do you know that you can serve God wherever you are? I mean, do you know, I mean, you know, Andy, I'm too young. No, you're not. Or Andy, I'm too old. No, you're not. You can serve God wherever you are. I mean, others of you may feel like these years that you're in right now, they're just preparation for what's next. Like this is where I, I learn to be you know, an adult or I learn what that means. So I'm just in preparation. God doesn't really expect me to do anything right now as much as he expects me to be prepared for what's next. Man, I just want to push back on that. No matter where you are, God can and will use you. I mean, Joseph is in prison, and God has still elevated him to a position of authority and leadership over that prison. Again, second only to the warden. And there's another thing I hope you notice here. It's at the end of verse 4. So the, verse 4 tells us the captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them. And look at these four words and he attended them. The word attended can also be understood and, and, and he served them. Again, I don't want to gloss over that. And we see an incredible example of leadership right here in verse four, that Joseph, when given leadership responsibilities, he expressed those responsibilities, not in power, not in bossing people around, but he expressed those responsibilities, what? In humility, in service. And I love that this principle is right here in the beginning of chapter 40, is that authority for Joseph meant service. He's the top dog, other than the warden, in the prison. And yet, what does he do? He serves the other prisoners. Jesus said something like this in Matthew 20. 
When he says, whoever wants to be great among you must become his servant. And, and I just love that if you explore leadership themes through the whole of Scripture, man, it, it cries out to us that leaders truly descend to greatness. We don't ascend to kind of some position, you know, I have the title, so you all ought to pay me respect. But no, there's more the sense of, how, how can I help you? How can I serve you? What are your needs? How are you feeling? I want to I wanna help you and I want to lead you through humble service. Look at verse 5. You'll see it. Keep that in mind as we read this. And one day they both dreamed. Okay, the cupbearer and the baker, they dreamed. And the, uh, it actually tells you, the cupbearer and the baker, the king of Egypt, um, who were confined in the prison each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. Look at six. Remember, leadership, serving, all those things. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were there with him, that's the cupbearer and the baker, hey, I want to talk to you guys. Look what he says at the end of seven. Why are your faces downcast? I mean, why? Like, guys, it's kind of a funny question, to one extent, right? Because they're in prison. <laughs> Why are you guys sad? Uh, look around. But it's also a, a really interesting question because he would have seen these men for some time at least every morning. And apparently these guys may have been in the same cell. I'm not really sure about all that, but just imagine a little bit with me that maybe the baker wakes up one morning and he clearly has anxiety or clearly has uh, my version says downcast, but like some sadness on his face because he just had a really weird dream. Have you ever had that? Where like dreams are so real, you like wake up, you're like, I need to go check on my kids, <laughs> right? Right? I mean, you just, you panic a little bit because of the dream you had. So he had something like that. And then maybe the cup bearer's on the other side of the cell and he sees his buddy. He's like, what? what's wrong with you? I just had a weird, really weird dream. Cup bearer's like, I did too. I got a really weird dream too. But I love Joseph. So you have like the normal sadness maybe of being in prison, but then you have this unique sadness that, that Joseph is discerning enough to notice. And he's compassionate enough to ask, why are you, why are you sad? What's going on? I think there's, a, again, there's a lesson for us in this that you never know how powerful a simple question about someone else's welfare can be. You're like, man, it, 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 something, something seems off today. You want to talk about it or how you feeling? Or... Joseph says to these two guys, and why, are you, why, are you so di- why are you downcast? I mean, don't you think that Joseph had enough of his own problems to deal with? He's in prison for something he didn't do. He's falsely accused and convicted for something he didn't do. He's been sold into slavery by his brothers who first wanted to kill him, and his dad, for all he knows, thinks he's dead. Any connection back to his family is wiped out. Joseph has enough problems of his own to deal with, and yet he steps out of that current of his own life and says, why are you sad? I mean, that is leadership. Why are you sad? I know I've got a lot, but but I want to actually hear about why you're sad. I want to identify with you right now, he's saying. Like, I want a little bit of the burden that you are carrying. I want to try to carry that for you and sort of put myself in that same boat as you are, but not in opposition, but sort of alongside of you. Let's look into this together. What's going on? I want to help. I want your problem to become my problem. So verse 8 is, is interesting. They said to him, so he's just said, why are you downcast? They said to him, well, we, we've had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. I want you to notice here, this is not idle curiosity. Like, have you ever asked somebody, hey, how you doing? And then they're like, well, and then they just start going about how not good or good they are. And like, you're checked out. You're like, man, I really didn't expect all that. I really, I just thought you'd say good. (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of idle curiosity when we do that. Like, how you doing? But I don't really want to know. This is Joseph saying, why are you downcast? Here's why. We've had these dreams. Nobody can interpret them. Joseph's like, I actually might know somebody who can. 
a man by the name of Don Barnhouse, and you don't remember, need to remember his name, but he helps us understand what this might have been like. He says, this is almost like, quote, the simplicity of a child who knows just where his father is and how to get a hold of him. You ever been there where you're like, ah, oh, my, my dad would know how to do this. Like, my dad's a superhero. <laughs> my dad would know this. In fact, I know how to get a hold of him. He's just down the street. This is like Joseph saying, hey, interpretations of dreams belong to God. I actually know that because I've had some dreams myself. Uh, why don't I get a hold of them for you? I think I can help. Week one, we talked a little bit about dreams. And by dreams, I mean actual revelation of God given to us while we sleep. Okay, I'm not talking about future aspirations and goals and things that we hope to achieve in life. And we use the word dream for that. But I'm talking about when you are unconscious, you have a dream, and the question is, does God speak or lead us or prompt us through dreams? Here's what I said week one. I just want to go back and touch on it because, again, we're talking dreams here. I don't believe dreams are the normative way that God speaks to us, nor do I believe that we should overlook the Scriptures as the main way to know God's heart for us. However, I also don't want to say that it is impossible for God to speak through dreams because there are examples in Scripture of God speaking through dreams, both to people who feared God and people who didn't. So then what is the purpose of dreams in the Scripture? It was to communicate special revelation to a person, to a unique person at a unique time in a unique place to advance the story of God's people. And let me give you a principle. If you've checked out on me, lean back in. This is important. Not all of Scripture is prescriptive. Okay, so when we read the Bible, we ought not to look at how God worked in the lives of the characters within the pages of Scripture and assume that, oh, well, that prescribes how he's going to work in my life. A lot of the Bible is descriptive. It, again, helps us as somebody from the outside looking in understand how God uniquely interacted with these particular people. However, let me say this too, and I want to remind you that I'm not saying that God can't lead through dreams or other things like that. But I, but I want to buffer that by just reminding us that if we really want to hear from God, I believe we start right here with his word. Like, Lord, I want to hear from you, and I want your word to speak to me. You say it is your breath on a page. So, so I want to understand what you have for me. So I'm going to read it, and I'm going to allow it to change me. And if God chooses then to speak to us in a dream, let's take what we think he has said to us in a dream and, and judge it by what he has said to us in his word. So the bottom line is really his word has to be that, that final arbiter of what we believe God has or has not said to us. May I give you an example of this, um, where this might show up in your life? Let, let's put this in context of like a really big decision, okay? Maybe you have a really big decision coming up. Maybe it's financial, career, like where to go to school, what to study, like these big decisions that are coming up, and, and, and you want to know how to make and how to hear from God to make that decision that honors him. When, when Becky and I were first married, I just graduated from seminary, and if anybody's going to hear the voice of God, I should be a seminary graduate. So I'm like, yeah, I'm ready to roll. Here we go, God, what do you have for me? I'm just kidding. And um, we had a job offer here in Cincinnati, and we had a job offer in Greenville, South Carolina. I wanted to go to Greenville. She wanted to stay in Cincinnati. I got no big deal. Oh, no, it was a big deal. <laughs> It was a big, big deal. Like, we could not talk about it without getting angry with each other. You know, and I just, I, I want to honor God. I mean, you know, right? You, you want to make a decision that honors God. It's like, Lord, why is this so difficult? Like, why don't you just speak to me and, like, tell me? Like, what am I supposed to do here? And I, read, I was reading the Bible, I was praying, doing all those things. I was like, what in the world? So, uh, I don't know if you know the story of Gideon in Judges 6. You're going to laugh, but Gideon was trying to figure out exactly what God wanted him to do. So Gideon took a fleece and laid a fleece out and said, God, you know, depending on what you want me to do, I want there to be, I want there to be a, a moisture on the fleece. So here I am in, what is this, 2002? 
And I thought, Lord, I don't know if you work like that anymore, but I'm going to put a fleece blanket out in my living room. So we bought a fleece blanket, laid a fleece blanket out in the living room and said, God, if you want us to you know, go to Greenville, would you, would you have there to be some, some moisture on the, on the blanket, but not on the carpet surrounding it? <laughs> Which if you know the story of Gideon in Judges 6, that's what he prayed. I said, I don't know if you do this anymore. So I went to bed that night, kind of half hopeful and kind of not. Woke up the next day, bone dry, everything, not even a drip. So I thought, well, maybe I did it wrong. So the next night I said, okay, no moisture on the fleece blanket, but can there be moisture on the carpet around it? Went to bed, half hopeful, half not, bone dry, nothing. We were no better off after pleading for the Lord to work that way in our lives and in that decision. Here's what I want to tell you. Number one, cover these, these heavy decisions in prayer. Start there at least, like start there. God says, if any of you wants wisdom, ask it. I mean, that's what he says. The second thing I would encourage you to do is making big decisions. And we're getting down. You'll see how this kind of rounds out with dreams. Number two is like, read your Bible. Like be faithful in your scriptures. Now it may not be as emotionally filling as some of these other kind of alternatives that are out there. But, but don't allow emotion to be what drives you and how you hear from the Lord in those leadings and promptings. I mean, man, sometimes praying and just reading the Bible, there's no emotion in it at all other than I'm going to do this because I want to hear from God. The third thing that you might do is pick up a devotional on the topic that you're working through. Now, please, exercise discernment. A lot of wingnuts have written devotionals on crazy stuff, so be careful. But pick up a devotional on the topic that you're working through. Number four, intentionally interact with other Jesus followers who are ahead of you in life and who maybe have made these decisions already. Like take them for a cup of coffee and say, what did you do? How did you hear God's voice in this decision? What am I missing? What can I do? Help me. God can speak through them. And then I thought it was important to mention too, be open to unintended conversations with Jesus followers. Like maybe people that you don't have that close of a relationship with, but they're kind of like Joseph in our story. They come to you and they're like, hey, something seems off with you today. What's up? Well, that might be the Lord bringing the two of you together in ways that normally wouldn't happen and might give you a chance to explain, and they could very well be the way that God leads you. But when all of that is done, I don't want to discount the role of some other less Um, tangible ways that God might lead you or prompt you. Things like worship music. Things like worship gatherings. I mean, things like other people's gifts of discernment, right? Not all of us have a gift of discernment, but some of us do. I mean, yes, things like dreams, or like when you wake up, you're like, man, I had a really weird dream. I don't know what to make of it. Well, Go and take it back to the scriptures or go and talk to somebody about, I had this dream. Could that be the Lord leading me or could that be the Lord prompting? Well, maybe. Let's just talk about it. Unexpected, crazy reminders of God. Maybe Bible verses that you've read a hundred times, but they never connected like they do that time as you're reading it. So here's what happened. So Becky and I couldn't make this decision, man. It was so hard. So we went and talked to a friend of ours who's a Christian counselor, and and, uh, she looked at us both across the table, and she said, Andy, do you remember what Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 5, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church and actually give himself up for the church? I said, yeah, but I don't think he really meant that. (laughs) She's like, why are you willing to do that? I said, no. So I went home. And after about a couple days, the, just the power of God's word just broke my heart. I was like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. So we never went to South Carolina. We stayed in Greenville. Or we stayed in Cincinnati. Um, yeah. You know what's crazy, though? You know what Jesus says in John 17? He said, your word is truth. Speaking to the Father, he's like, your word is truth. We have his word right here. So, so please understand me. I'm not saying that God cannot communicate in dreams. I just don't think that ought to be the normative way we look for him to lead us and guide us. Okay, so let's keep going. So look what happens. Um, Genesis 4, let's start in verse 9. Here, I want to speed it up a little bit. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, here's what happened. In my dream, there was a vine before me, and, the vine was, uh, the vine, and on the vine there were three branches, and as soon as it budded, it bloss- its blossoms shot forth, and clusters ripened into grapes. 
Okay, so that's basically the process of winemaking in two verses. Uh, but that's what he saw in his dream. Verse 11, Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and I pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Basically what he's saying is, Joseph, what do you make of this? Here's my dream. Joseph, verse 12, said to me, this is its interpretation. Here we go. The three branches are three days. Verse 13 is powerful. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. Look, if somebody tells you the future and they don't give you a time frame, like, yeah, okay, I don't believe you. He's like, no, here's what's going to happen. In three days, you are going to be restored. So this was an easily provable dream or easily provable interpretation. Uh, he says, and, and you shall place the Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cupbearer. Look at 14. Only, it's like he's saying, but please remember me when it is well with you and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh. Why? Get me out of this place or get me out of this house. And look at 15. It's sad, but it's so true. I was indeed stolen out of the land of Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that they should put me into the pit. What I love about this is why I opened the way I did. You sense this like kind of disappointment in Joseph. Like I didn't do anything to deserve where I am. The question is, does he actually get to where he's disappointed in God? You don't see that here. But you do kind of catch this, again, very real and familiar feeling that we all have. Like the, the, the people have completely let me down. I mean, people will always let us down. And for Joseph, it started all the way back in his family. But it's like one thing along the way, I'm obeying, bad consequences. I obey, bad consequences. I obey, bad consequences. And he's like, listen, Mr. Cupbearer, you have a really great future ahead of you. In three days, you're going to be restored. Would you please remember me? Do you notice Joseph is not passive. Joseph isn't sitting in the corner of the jail cell just waiting for the doors to fall off. Sometimes spirituality almost makes us so passive. There's like, God, I need a job. I'm just going to sit back until you provide one. Or God, I need out of this prison and I'm just going to sit back until the doors just completely fall. What I love about this story is Joseph says with a little bit of sanctified common sense, right? That, hey, would you remember me when you're restored? So God, yes, God is always working behind the scenes in our lives. We trust that and we know that, but there is a certain amount of human responsibility that leads us to reach out and grasp a hold of opportunities as they're presented to us that God might be dropping right in front of us. Joseph did it. Remember me when, it's, when it is well with you. Look at 16, kind of sad, kind of funny. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable... <laughs> So he's like, oh, he got a good interpretation. I'll ask about my dream. He said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked foods for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. Verse 18, Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. <laughs> yeah. What do you think he's thinking? That's why it's a little bit funny and, and like so bad to say it's funny. I mean, it's, it's like he's like, oh, hold on. Like, what in the world? That, you know, Larry over there got a really, really great interpretation of his dream. What, what about me? Like, here, here's what I love, and I want to quickly move past this, but I don't want to go too fast. Man, You've got a man in Joseph who loves the truth so much that he gives a, the truthful good message to the cupbearer, but he's willing to give the truthful bad message to the baker. You see that? Like he's not so concerned about what they think of him that he waters down or sanitizes the truth. He says what he knows. And, and may I just press into all of us here today, as much as he was faithful to the cupbearer, he was faithful to the baker. He didn't slink away from that conversation. May we be people who love Christ so much that we are able to not only preach the cupbearer's sermon, but we're able to preach the baker's too. That we're willing to tell truth to people who love what we're saying, but we're still lovingly willing to tell truth to people who don't. 
So here's what happens, verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, remember, the third day matters. Joseph said both these guys' dreams are going to come true in three days. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants, and he lifted up, or he brought out of prison, the, chief, the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. 21, he restored the chief cupbearer to his position, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Verse 23, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. That's disappointing. Here's what I think happened. I don't think the cupbearer got into the throne room of Pharaoh and just forgot Joseph, like you and I might forget our car keys. I think the cupbearer was restored to his position, got back around Pharaoh, saw what happened to his buddy who he's been in prison with for some time, doesn't want anything to be associated around this plot that apparently they figured out and the baker maybe was actually the one who uh, had the plot against Pharaoh. They figured all of that out, but the cupbearer in some respects is still kind of indirectly guilty by association. I think he intentionally didn't bring up Joseph's name because he doesn't want to call attention to the fact that he spent any time in prison. He just wants to like wash his hands of this whole situation because his very life was at stake and he was restored. So you, you, we can understand the relief. Like, whew, I never want to be there again. Oh, but there's a guy down there named Joseph. I told him I would talk to Pharaoh. I'm just not going to do it because I don't want Pharaoh to remember me in prison for what I was put there for. You see, that's disappointing. And we could even say it's despairing if you're Joseph because at the end, in my Bible, at the end of verse 23 of chapter 40, there's a little bit of white space. And then chapter 41, verse 1 says, after two whole years. So poor Joseph. Hey, man, would you remember me? Yes, I'll remember you. And then he doesn't, and he sits in jail for another two years. Don't you think it would be so easy? Here's what this means to, to you and me today as we come down to the end of, of chapter 40. What, what do we do with this? Because you've got Joseph who, again, disappoint, people are going to disappoint us. right? That, that's a common experience we've had and will have. People are going to disappoint us, just like this cupbearer disappointed Joseph. But how did he ensure that he didn't go from being disappointed in people to being disappointed in God? Like, How can we, how can you and I here in 2024, because look, we are all gonna face disappointment. Some of you are in it right now. Some of you are asking questions like, why God? Why didn't you stop this? Why didn't you hold their hand like back? Why didn't you restrain them? Or why did this happen? Where were you? Joseph, the way he processed disappointment didn't lead him to blame God. It actually helped him realize that within the disappointment, there was incredible opportunity for God to show up. Andy, I don't really know how to do that. Well, let me give you a few things to jot down quickly. We're gonna hope in God. And here's what it's gonna look like in our lives. We're gonna focus on serving other people instead of pitying ourselves. Man, we gotta get that. Joseph is in prison. He had every right to say, look, guys, I don't care about your dreams. I'm in here because of dreams. I don't care what you're going through. I don't really care that your faces are downcast. I've got enough junk going on in my life that I don't have time to talk to you about theirs. He could have self-pitied, and we probably would have understood and said, it's okay, he's been through a lot. But he doesn't. He asks a probing question why are you guys sad? And it wasn't, again, idle curiosity. It was a man full of character, compassion, and discernment, and perception. And he says, I'm ready for the answer. When we are hoping in Christ, we don't get bogged down by what's happening in our lives. We actually see it as ministry moments and ministry opportunities. Then now I might have perception. I didn't before. Let me talk to people about it. I'm not gonna pity myself. The second thing, that if our hope is, is in God, this may sound trite to you. Let me explain. If our hope is in God, we are going to have a positive and expectant view and not a cynical and pessimistic one. 
it, it's not just happy thinking, okay? I would never tell you that. But we can have joy in our own prisons. I mean, we can. We, we can have joy when it seems like, God, I obeyed you. I did all the right things, and yet this is what happens to me. Joseph could have said, don't waste your time, guys. There's nothing special about dreams. I've had a few of them. Nothing special about them. But no, he didn't. He said, okay, this is an opportunity. I'm, I'm going to live expectantly. I'm going to live full of joy no matter what is happening around me. Again, looking for ministry moments and opportunities. Somebody said this, you, you can't control what happens to you, but what can you control? How you respond to it. That's so true. It's for me as much as it is for you. I can't control what happens to me, but I don't have to go down the kind of the expected way of reaction and response. I can actually lean into it and I can trust and know that God has me and say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go the other way. I'm gonna find joy in all of this. And then lastly, number three, if, if, if our hope is in God, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna be eager to invite him into the solutions. And, and eager is an intentional word there. I wanted us to get this idea of, I cannot wait to bring God into this. That's what verse eight, that's what happens. Joseph's like, why are you guys sad? Well, we've had some dreams. We don't know what they mean. Joseph's like, <laughs> I know a guy. And I cannot wait to introduce you to him because he's kind of in the dreams business. It's almost like you need help. God, <laughs> I, I can't make sense of this. God, I don't really know what to do. God, if your hope is in God, he is going to be the first person that you're eager to invite into the situation, not the last. Let me close with this story. 19th century British preacher, you probably know his name at least, Charles Spurgeon. Uh, man, if you don't, I'd encourage you to, to read up on him. He was a fiery Baptist preacher. In, uh, in Britain, but uh, he was riding home one day and this is, he tells this story after a heavy day of work. So a lot of preaching and he was, he was despairing because he just felt like people weren't responding. You know, he preaches his guts out and nobody responds. And just suddenly he tells a story that, that 2 Corinthians chapter 12 came to mind. Verse nine says, my grace is sufficient for you. And in his own words, he said, out loud, I should think it is, Lord. <laughs> and if you know him, he's just a big old Baptist preacher. So you can almost see him shouting it way too loudly on the back of a horse. I should think it is, Lord, you know. It seemed to make his unbelief so absurd. And then he goes to tell this illustration. He said it was as if a little fish, being very thirsty, was worried about drinking the river dry. And the river said, drink away, little fish. My river is sufficient for you. Or it seemed like a little mouse in the granaries of Egypt after seven years of plenty, fearing it might die of famine. And Joseph looks at the mouse and says, cheer up, little guy. My granaries are sufficient for you. Or it was like a man who on a mountain said to himself, I fear that I shall exhaust all of the oxygen in the atmosphere but the earth might say, breathe away, O oh man, and fill your lungs. My atmosphere is sufficient for you. And he says this, you cannot exhaust the grace of God to meet your need in every trial. I mean, how crazy is it to think that one man could actually drain the atmosphere of oxygen? We go, yeah, that's stupid. That would never happen. How similarly crazy would it be for us to think that God's grace is not sufficient for whatever disappointment and despair that we face. Joseph is living that. And I pray that over you now. Father, I do pray and thank you for your word. I mean, I'm in I mean it's, it's incredible to see Jesus in Joseph here. That Joseph, Joseph set aside what he was what he was carrying him and the burdens that were on him and he came to these men and said what's, what's wrong I want to step into your problems I want your problems to become my problems and I want to help you find a solution I mean it's beautiful to think of Jesus that way that Jesus kind of came from heaven into our prisons and he said look you, you have a problem and actually 
I'm here to, to solve that for you by giving my life for you. So your problems are now my problems. So Lord, I pray that today, man, no matter where we come from, I have this picture, we, we come from all over the city, from different regions around the city. Some of us are going home even right now to, to challenging and, and potentially disappointing situations. Some of us step back into it tomorrow in the marketplace during the work week. And I pray today that we be reminded through the person and the work of Joseph in the prison, that Lord, we want to be eager to invite you in. We're not gonna pity ourselves. We're not gonna be pessimistic and cynical. We're gonna find joy. We're gonna, we're gonna go after joy. We're gonna invite you in and we're gonna fall to our knees. Pray, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but I'm obeying. I'm gonna leave the consequences to you. God, there's freedom in that as we fall kind of into your loving embrace. And, I may, and may we experience that both individually this week and as a church family. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. And it is in your name I pray. Amen.
thanks so much for being here today. Just a reminder, Tuesday at 6.30 is the Young Adult Night of Worship. Uh, if you're 18 to 30, come on out. There's going to be dinner, worship. It's going to be a great time. Hope to see you there. Have a good week, guys.